Stay hungry, stay foolish. The context of business has changed so rapidly over the past few decades that it may be time for a new lexicon. At the very least, it's time to challenge some of the established thinking about strategy and competition that used to drive business advantage, but no longer does. In today's episode, strategy expert and Columbia Business School professor Rita McGrath takes on one of the most fundamental and recognized no notions in strategy, that of sustainable competitive advantage. She argues this can no longer be the holy grail for companies because in a constantly changing environment, deeply ingrained structures and systems designed to extract value actually become a liability. The new path to winning includes taking advantage of shorter term opportunities, as well as relying on new organizational talents like speed and decisiveness. Our guest defines the new transient life cycle of competitive advantage and shows how successful firms manage through it by using an updated philosophy. She offers a bold new set of principles for competing in what we now understand is a continuously volatile and uncertain environment. Consider this your fresh strategy playbook for competing in an accelerating world. We welcome author of End of Competitive Advantage, How to Keep Your Strategy Moving as Fast as Your Business, Rita McGrath, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on the show, Rita. And I want to highlight my thanks to you for covering your earlier work here. So this book is almost a decade old, while Seeing Around Corners is your latest book and is an absolute knockout and one I hope to cover in the near future. But I wanted to cover this book for many reasons. One is I find it is a must read for anyone who works in innovation. Two is it's been highly recommended by previous guests like Alex Osterwalder, Whitney Johnson, Mark Johnson, Scott D. Anthony, and many others. And a lot of people I've talked to read have not read this book, but know you from your current work. And again, I want to greatly thank you for covering this earlier work. So with that, let's start with the opening statement from this book, even though it was published almost a decade ago, unfortunately, it still holds true. And you open with virtually all strategy frameworks and tools are based on a single dominant idea that the purpose of strategy is to achieve a sustainable competitive advantage. It's every company's holy grail, but it's no longer relevant. So in its place, you offer a different concept, one of transient competing advantage where we win short-lived opportunities. I'd love if you'd take us on the journey of this, Rita. Oh, it'd be a pleasure. So in strategy, there were several dominant concepts that became integral to all the tools and frameworks we used in the field. And the first was this idea of industry, that your fate would be predicted by finding an attractive position in an attractive industry. And your goal then was to throw up entry barriers like crazy. And, uh, giggle your way into a happy life. <laughs> so the first thing that I would argue is that the period of achieving what we've called a competitive advantage, and I'm even beginning to wonder about the relevance of that term, but that, that period where we have something in place that exists, we've got transactions with customers, we've got profits, we've got margins, that period is getting shorter and shorter. So if you look when these theories were developed, they were developed largely out of the U.S., largely in the halcyon post-war environment where China wasn't a global competitor, India wasn't a global competitor. We didn't have technology as we know it now. And if you had something you were making, you know, if you made tires or refrigerators or whatever as an American firm and you did the game properly, you could achieve global advantage and that would last for a long time. And so we have all these ideas in strategy that stem from that central concept, which is that an advantage can last forever or for you know decades, let's say. And what I've argued is that increasingly what we need is a set of theories that deal with each phase of the lifespan of a competitive advantage. So you have the innovation process, which leads you to the creation of new advantages. You indeed have the exploitation process where you get to enjoy the fruits of your labor. But then, you know, 
something changes in the world. You have a COVID epidemic, you have <laughs> a customer revolution, you have something that's different, and your advantage goes into erosion. And the core thesis of the book is that our theories of strategy need to deal with each of those life cycle phases. Yeah, and I was thinking about the language you introduced, Rita, because it's so important. Updating our language helps us update our thinking. And it reminded me of Einstein's quote that we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. And in respect to your work, you suggest upgrading the tools that are decades old and were built for a different world and very much an American world that wasn't globalized yet. These tools aren't bad tools, but they have to be used in the right boundary conditions. And I think that's one of the things we misunderstand, which is the same tool in different boundary conditions doesn't work. So let me take an example of a brilliant tool, which was the BCG matrix. And people today have forgotten where it came from. And where it came from was the study of learning curve effects beginning with the aviation industry. And what researchers found was that there was a predictable drop in costs the more of whatever it was you were making you made. And that was called the learning curve effect. And you could actually plot a drop in costs on a chart. And if you did it on a log scale, it was a straight line decline. So, you know, if you made 10, it costs you a dollar, let's say. And if you made a thousand, it costs you 50 cents. And if you made 10,000, it costs you a nickel. <laughs> That's another thing. Um, and so what BCG worked out was they said, well, if you are present in the early stages of a high growth industry and you invest heavily, you can produce more than your competitors in that industry. And that will allow you to get a cost advantage, which would be durable. And so what that suggested is they had a very simple matrix, which had um, uh, industry growth rate on one dimension and your market share on another dimension. And then they were able to divide the world into four categories. So you had your shooting stars, which were your high growth things that you'd invest in those. You had your cash cows, which is growth is now slowed. And, you know, ideally you're exploiting the fact that you have a cost advantage. Um, you've got your um, question marks. And I've always wondered, you know, a two by two where a quarter of the potential cases have never been explained is very, very odd to me. And then you had, like, which is you've got a small share in a small business. And, you know, in the right boundary conditions, that's a terrific framework. But. Let's say you're in an industry where you don't have heavy duty learning curve effects. So most services businesses, as an example, um, and that advice. So the advice from the BCG matrix was invest heavily in your shooting stars, milk your cows, uh, get rid of your dogs. And who knows what you're doing with your question mark. But that advice doesn't work in cases where that it's a different boundary condition. Plus, what's market share? We know people have forgotten we make up market share. It's, it's a human constructed thing. God did not come down and say thou, thou shalt have 30% market share. I mean, <laughs> if I wanted to define market share to my own advantage, you know, let's say I was going to be the only business school professor, you know, in, in my block in Princeton, New Jersey, <laughs> um, I could easily define myself as having 100% market share. Voila, job done. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think what we do is we take these matrices and the BCG matrix was phenomenally successful. And we we put them into every situation. We don't really look carefully at whether the explanatory variables that they found hold in the situation we're trying to understand. I loved your analogy of surfing the waves and how surfers don't get embarrassed when they get knocked down. I think the conceptual image of that is so important when it comes to seeking and exploiting. So I think one of the things to remember is if you accept the idea that advantages are temporary, what you want to be thinking about mentally is, you know, imagine imagine riding successive waves of competitive advantage. So you need to be uh, able to see when one is beginning to form, and then you need to get up on that surfboard and uh, ride it. And then when the wave is over, you step off and you look for the next one. And that's really the imagery that I think we need to be adopting more when we're thinking about strategy and competitive advantage. And, you know, culturally, I think it's a big shift because it moves you from defending, you know, defending what you were doing and being sort of, I'm going to protect my castle, you know, I'm going to put a moat around it and I'm going to defend it versus maybe this one is short lived, but the next one's going to be great. And the one after that's going to be even greater. And, you know, if one doesn't work, well, I've got plenty more in the pipeline. And I think that's the mentality that we want. So it brings innovation very much 
to the center of what we think about when we think of strategy. And, you know, when I think about my time in the field, when I first started in strategy, all the cool kids were doing industry analysis. And it was all about this thing called the Profit Impact of Market Strategies Database, which was a fabulous database that GE had put together. Um, but it was all about industry phenomena. So it was things like um, how much does market share pay off for you? And does it make a difference if you have a big R&D budget? Should you be a first mover or a later mover? And, you know, it was all great stuff, but but it was really based on these boundary conditions of having predictable industry boundaries, having a known number of players. And those of us doing innovation work, we were kind of like huddled in the corner for warmth. I mean, it was bad. We were, we, cause we were studying what went on inside companies. We were studying the actions and decisions of individual decision makers. We were studying, you know, we were studying that period before an industry exists, before you have customers, before you have established market transactions, before you even know what the price is you're going to charge for something. And that's what I was interested in. And what I would say is in the intervening years that people have now become sensitized to the idea that innovation is essential. Innovation is really uh, important. And it's important because that's where the next wave comes from. And so now I think where we are, I think the state of the art at the moment is people understand that they know where the next wave is going to come from, but they still don't know what to do about it. They're all like this innovation thing is this huge question mark. So one of the things I think is fascinating in the midst of this COVID crisis is you know, those of us studying innovation, we've been in high uncertainty environments our whole lives. Um, whereas, you know, it's entirely possible to be a very senior executive in a large organization today, and you've never touched or run across or had anything to do with innovation. And so there's an awful lot of people out there kind of with question marks hanging over their heads, really not knowing what to do. And the good news, I think, is that the, um, the tools that we've used in innovation, if you're running a show called the Innovation Show, so it's, you'll be very, very clear on this, the tools we've traditionally used for innovation are incredibly practical and meaningful now that we're in the midst of this highly uncertain crisis. Yeah, it really has come of its time. And there's a concern, though, in, in the same time, Rita, and it's come up on several shows recently that in times like this, and you talk about deafness and letting go of maybe business models or products or services that no longer serve the organization. But oftentimes in times of crisis like this, organizations see the innovation team as something they need to let go of because it's an unnecessary cost. And it's a real concern for me and so many people who listen to the show at the moment. I'd love your thoughts on that. Oh, it's it's very true. Very true. You know, if you're being motivated by a quarter to quarter mindset and, you know, what you want to know is what's the ROI on this going to be, you know, your innovation teams are very hard to defend because by definition, they're 18 months, 24 months, 36 months out before you start to get cash out of something. Um, and so if you're in a crisis, it, it, it becomes a justifiable thing to get rid of. Um, the counterbalance, I would say, is you're not going to get out of this crisis by doing what you were doing before the crisis. Um, you really need a novel solution. You need a fresh way of looking at things if you're going to thrive. And that's where the tools and the structures that your innovation teams create are so helpful. So I think the one of the big differences we're going to see between companies that thrive after coming out of this and companies that just, you know, sort of implode from the inside is how they think about the innovation process. The other thing that, you know, we were talking about the concepts of the waves and getting knocked off is that you talk about moving from industries to arenas. And this is a really core concept to your work. Yeah. And I think that's something even today, you know, the, the, the notion of industry is so embedded to an extent that really surprises me. So we've got, you know, industry constructs, we've got industry conferences, you've got, you know, trade associations, which are, you know, I'm the metal services industry representative. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it blinds us to the fact that there are completely different ways of thinking about things. So, you know, a great example of this is years ago, and this is going back quite a few years, when Gus Weta was the CEO of uh, Coca-Cola. Um, you know, and he was really um, pissed off at his senior team, basically, because they were saying, oh, you know, the market is busy drinks, it's saturated, and Pepsi's creating trouble, blah, 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 blah. They're just whining, basically. And he kind of assembled all the senior leaders, and he said something um, that I thought was fascinating. He said, look, the average human being needs 64 ounces of fluid per day to stay alive. 
And your job as as leaders in the Coca-Cola company is to increase the percentage of those ounces that are sold by the Coca-Cola company. So the enemy is not Pepsi. The enemy is milk and tea and water and you know, gold. <laughs> You're different things. And, you know, what he really did was he redefined the industry from the fizzy drink business to the, you know, how many fluid ounces business. And, and that, that totally changed the strategy. I mean, that got them into water. You know, they're not a huge provider of bottled water. It got them into non-carbonated beverages. It got them into all kinds of stuff. Um, and I think that redefinition of what our playing field is was key to what later became uh, central to Coke's strategy. Brilliant. And, you highlight here, and to the point about Coca-Cola, that many of the waves are in motion, and they're in motion at different stages of the revolution, but all at the same time. And they require a different mindset and different people and resources for those different stages. And therefore, the job of senior leadership is not to manage or defend, but it's to orchestrate the concurrent mm -hmm. waves. Yeah, a friend of mine who's the CEO, it had a wonderful analogy. He said, think about it as like being a chef in a, in a high-end kitchen. And all around you, you know, you've got dishes in various states of preparedness. And your job is to make sure that the right dishes get to the right plates, get to the right people in the right order at the right time. And that's much more what being a CEO is like than, you know, the traditional metaphors we have for running a business. And I think that's become particularly true now when we're surrounded by so much uncertainty that you don't have time to be a hierarchical leader. You can't tell people what to do because you don't know what to do yourself. And I think that you have to create the conditions under which the people that have the best information can come together and reveal what the answer is rather than you having the answer and telling people what to do. I mean, that's a very outdated vision of leadership. While we're on that, you've seen the value of this in your own work where you've set up a, a tool, a diagnostic tool to help teams go beyond just the strategy to actually embed it within the company. And perhaps we'll share a little bit about this before we go on with competitive advantage. Oh, I'd be happy to. So Valise is a concept I've been working on for probably about four years now. And it began with this fundamental frustration, which is people read my work or come to a talk or come to a class at Columbia or whatever, and they get really inspired and they think, this is great. This is a whole new way of looking at things. But they go back to their home organization and there's this question, right? Is it a spreadsheet? Is it a PowerPoint? Is it a, a different kind of meeting? I need to like, what is this? And so what occurred to me was that in addition to the insight generation that I think is what I try to do with my professional work, is there was also a concurrent need for capability creation. And so what Belize is put on earth to do, uh, I hope, <laughs> is going to be to help firms build those capabilities those strategic capabilities to help them build those muscles uh, to be able to do this stuff real. Because a lot of our existing tools are based on these older ideas that just don't work. And when I look at how people are actually doing strategy and innovation today, you know, it's still locked up individual spreadsheets. Maybe maybe it's made it as far as a Google sheet where it's generic. Yeah, there's no kind of consistent architecture to to how they do these things. And that's one of the things Belize is really uh, exploring and and beginning to build. So we have three uh, kinds of things that, that we do at Belize. So the first is, I'll call them uh, point solutions. So um, there's a team effectiveness diagnostic, for example. There's a diagnostic where you can assess how um, how oriented are you to the past? You know, are, you, are you in a sustainable competitive advantage mindset or are you look more oriented to transient advantage? Then we've got a platform that we're building, which will help deal with the fundamental challenge of the innovation process, which is, you think about innovation, and I looked at software to help with that, and there's a mountain of applications and so forth that help with the idea generation process, so you can run an idea generation campaign, you can collect ideas, you can have a hackathon, you can do all these things, and there's mountains of applications that'll do that, so I said, well, that's, that's been solved. Um, and then on the back end, right, there's a mountain of stuff that does project management. So you finally decided you need to build a plant or you need to go overseas or you need to orchestrate your supply chain. There's stuff, you know, there's tons of stuff that does that project management software. The tricky part is in the middle. <laughs> How do you go from this idea to something that you can actually plug into your project management software? And so that's the platform that we're building. It's uh, hoping to address that. And then we have a little bit of capability building sort of training advisory to help people learn how to use those tools. 
So that's that's the core what what Belize is in the process of doing. This is such a core piece, and you dedicate a whole chapter to leadership mindset mm. in the end of competitive advantage and. I'd love to share a couple of examples here because there's real great examples of leadership and then not so great examples as well, cautionary tales. So one of the great examples you give was Alan Mulally. And when he started, he ran into some initial instances of resistance, but he soon sorted those out. So Alan Mulally is a great example of what I think leadership today is all about. So he was at Boeing. Um, so a little bit of Alan's backstory is very interesting. He wanted to be an astronaut. And it turns out he's colorblind. <laughs> so that, that disqualified him. So he decided to do the next best thing and get into the aerospace in, in industry as an engineer. And he was at Boeing for many years um, and basically rescued their commercial airplanes division after the disaster that was 9-11. And nobody was buying commercial airplanes, which was a bit of a And uh, he was persuaded some years later. Uh, by uh, the, the Ford family to come and sort of turn around things at Ford. And when he was first going there, he uh, got met at the airport and driven to the executive parking garage of Ford Motor Company. And he looked around, <laughs> and, he looked around and he held no Ford branded cars in the executive parking garage. That's Ford <laughs> Motor Company. He said, hmm, well, that's an interesting <laughs> subtle indicator, right? These people don't believe in their own brand. And the culture of Ford leadership at the time was pretty toxic. Um, so your enemy was not General Motors. Your enemy was, you know, the guy down the hall who w- was competing with you for the next stage of, of executive leadership. Uh, so very internally competitive. You hid your mistakes. You didn't admit failure. They didn't trust each other. It was really, really bad. So Alan's um, leadership methodology uh, is centered on a couple of key things, but one of the key things is what he calls his business plan review meeting, which is a once a week meeting where each of his direct reports and their support staff gather together and everybody's got in front of them a PowerPoint, which has their five most important objectives for the week. And they're color coded. So green is good. I'm on track. Things are good. Yellow is, well, I've got some setbacks and problems, but I kind of know what to do with them. And then red is, oh, you know, I've got a problem. I have no idea what to do with it. And so shortly before the first of these meetings, which none of the leaders wanted to come to, um, but he he sort of forced them to. He's like, oh, you don't want to come to my meeting? Oh, well, that's okay. Um, You can't be part of the senior leadership team at Ford if you don't come to my meeting, but it doesn't mean you're a bad person. (laughs) I mean, that's... He's still unfailingly positive. But anyway, uh, so first of these meetings comes, and a couple of days before, he had a very serious sit-down with Ford's CFO, who basically said, look, this company's on track to lose, I think it was $16.9 billion, well, close to $17 billion. That's with a B that year. So huge losses, right? They're staring bankruptcy. It's basically it was six. So he comes in. First of these business plan review meetings, they're all there. None of the senior leaders want to be there, right? They have people who do stuff for them. And so they've actually got to present their own results. They've got to own their own activity. Um, and uh, and Alan looks around the table. They've all got their papers in front of them, and it's all green. And he's looking <laughs> at them. <laughs> yeah, people, um, is it conceivably possible there might be like one small problem here? Uh, and um, he said something I thought was really profound. He said, you can't manage a secret. You know, if we can work together as a team, get these things resolved, um, we we have the power in this room to fix it, but if we don't work together, it's never going to happen. And so, some weeks later, Mark Fields, who subsequently became CEO after uh, Alan retired, uh, sort of said, "All right, all right, I think I got one of those red things Alan is going on about." Uh, he said, "I'm red on Edge." Now, the launch of the Edge, which was a small SUV, was absolutely critical to Ford's product strategy, um, and the dealers had been humped up, um, you know. With, about it, the advertising budget has been set aside, everybody's been preparing for it. And and Mark had done the right thing, which was he'd stopped the production line because of the manufacturing quality problem. Um, but, you know, <laughs> this is a big, huge admission of things not going well. So the whole room goes completely blank. And what Alan does in the next 30 seconds is going to determine the future of his career at Ford. And so what does he do? He stands up and applauds. Right. Great transparency, Mark. Anybody got any ideas? 
and stops the meeting for a minute. And it turns out in that room, there were two people that had experience with the manufacturing issue that, that, that Mark was dealing with and could, could help out. There was a person who had a great idea for how to deal with the dealers. There was another person. I think like within four minutes, they had probably 70% of the solution to that problem uh, worked out. And to me, that's just a brilliant example of how the leader's not telling them what, what he's doing is creating the content in which the best minds can sort out the answers for themselves. It's so important, isn't it? And, you know, it's one of the reasons I mentioned Valise, and I'm sure one of the reasons you're graded Valise is because, as Amy Edmondson says, psychological safety is the soil in which innovation mm-hmm. grows. We need it within organizations for that to happen. And there's so many companies like Ford still in existence. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to share your book was it's not outdated in any sense. Unfortunately, it should be. But it's not. And these concepts you talk about still haven't taken root within organizations because of that fear. And maybe it's an overhang from 2008, 2009, from the financial downturn, and people were afraid of losing their jobs. But until we shift that paradigm, we're not going to see much change in organizations. Well, so I have to tell you a funny sort of thing that happens in my life, which is so I published uh, an article called Discovery Driven Planning back in 1995 with my co-author Ian McMillan. And for years, people were like, yeah, that's a really interesting idea, but I just I don't understand it. It's really hard for me to get my head around it. And then Eric Ries published uh, a work that, well, Steve Blank uh, talked about it, a famous entrepreneur, talk, taught it in Berkeley. Eric Ries is one of his students. He published a very well-received book called The Lean Startup, which echoes some of the same principles. Um, and people started to really get it, right? And, and so after I published End of Advantage, people were saying to me, oh, you know, your work on discovery driven planning, discovery driven growth, I get that now. I really understand it. But this End of Advantage stuff, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know quite what that means. It's like it in 10 years, you know? <laughs> That's sort of how I feel about it. But yeah, I think it's just a set of ideas that are not yet mainstream, but with luck, we'll get yeah, and, and you know, Steve, Steve Blank's been on the show and, you know, his idea of explore and exploit, Alex Osterwalder talks about it. It's, it's the same mental model and it's something that we still haven't got our minds around. It's not about this, def- you know, building that advantage and then defending it because things are moving just too fast. And I'm saying that to tee us mm-hmm. up for the whole idea of moving the mindset from ownership to access, because again, this is a core concept of your work. Yeah. So I think one of the things that's, and I'll take it back to academia um, for a minute, which is a very long tradition in, in economics has been this distinction between what do you need to manage with a hierarchy, so a bureaucracy, and what can you manage on an open market? And people like Oliver Williamson, the all the way after Ronald Coase, basically said, look, there's conditions under which markets function and conditions under which they don't. So you need a, a bureaucracy when you can't determine price, when you have uncertainty as to the incentive, so there's the incentive to cheat, uh, when transactions are really, really difficult and expensive, and blah, blah, blah. So, so that's why you need things in organizations, and that's why you lock assets in organizations, because it's just so difficult. And if you think about... Um, any asset intensive activity, right, that, that, that used to happen. So what's happened in the intervening years, and I think digital has a huge role to play in this, is we've reduced transaction costs tremendously. We've increased transparency by an order of magnitude. And we've made it very, very easy to understand what value is. And so a lot of the conditions that used to say, hey, you've got to manage this thing in a bureaucracy have now evaporated to the point where you can manage more and more sets of activities as markets. And that has a couple of very interesting downstream implications. The first is you don't need to own the asset to access it. So, you know, how many people really need to own a chainsaw, right? What what you really need, unless you're on a very car or something. But, you know, you need a chainsaw, hopefully not more than two or three times a year. So why should it be sitting in your garage gathering dust the rest of the time? What you really like to be able to do is, is use the chainsaw when you need it and hand it back to some central pool when you don't. And of course, the, the, the so-called sharing economy, you know, Airbnb and the like have shown that things we used to think of as, as needing to be owned, like our homes, uh, can now actually be accessed by people who don't own them. 
Um, so that's one thing. Um, second thing, though, that we're starting to see is, is another thing I don't think that gets talked about enough is because now we're in this mode where we can freely trade assets in a pretty straightforward way, um, we're depending more on our ecosystems. And so what you're seeing is ecosystems competing almost with ecosystems. And the question of ecosystem ripeness is what I call it, is a very interesting one from an entrepreneurial perspective, because you can have the best idea, the best product, the best whatever. Uh, but if your ecosystem isn't ripe, it's not going to be successful. So a great example of that is you know, our current faddish adoration of autonomous vehicles. You know, and if you talk to some people and you honestly think the Jetsons is here, right? They're going <laughs> to come to your apartment. It's going to whisk you off to your office on the 52nd floor, drop you right off on the terrace outside. <laughs> and then it's going to go off and deal with the next customer. Um, and so listen to some people. That's, that's right around the corner. But if you think about the ecosystem, you know, the technology is the least of our problems. The technology is actually probably 95% of where it needs to be to get, to get autonomous technology in place. What we don't have is the ownership regime. We don't have the risk regime. We don't know who to blame if the car decides to hit the granny and not the baby. We don't know, you know, there's just so much that needs to be put in place before these things. We don't even know who's going to own them. We don't know the effect on traffic congestion. Where are they going to live when they're not picking you up or dropping you off? You know, are we going to have like giant parking garages in the sky when there's no demand? I mean, just all this stuff. It's not that true. And so this whole like enthusiasm, which I applaud, I think it's great. It's the entrepreneurial spirit. But if we don't understand all those things, we're not going to have a mature, right ecosystem. And it's going to take a lot for, for that to eventually fall into place. Yeah. And so sure. I, I often think of that with drones either. It's, you know, the whole idea of drone delivery. It's like, well, I don't want a drone going over my house. Who owns that airspace above my house, et cetera. And it, mm-hmm. it's not a paradigm, isn't it? It's the Thomas Kuhn the paradigm shift and and it's almost like you know as i think it was max planck said that the old regime need to die out before the new regime comes in and coming mm-hmm. back to leadership then coming back into organizations this mindset takes a long time to change it really does and oftentimes it needs a crisis but as you show in your work the idea of deafness and letting go timely letting go of things that aren't working out is absolutely core and I'd love to bring it back to a couple of the examples that you give in the book, because one of them that has worked out magnificently and you pinpointed it back then was Netflix, because oftentimes we see Netflix as this great success today, but there was a key inflection point in Netflix when it changed from a DVD business to a streaming business. And you cover this as a case within your book. Absolutely. So the Netflix example is fascinating to me because most companies don't see these inflection points early. And so they, they lag in how they respond to them. Whereas Reed Hastings at Netflix had always thought from the beginning that it would be a streaming business. And he's been interviewed saying that, that he thought, oh, you know, we thought it was going to be 2002. Then we thought it was going to be 2004. Then we thought it was going to be. And and yet this is another ecosystem story, right? Because, you know, we need for Netflix's streaming business to be successful. We needed a critical mass of people to have high speed, always on one price internet in their homes. Uh, And that took a long time to happen. I think it first started to be a reality right around 2000. Um, And if you think about how you got on the internet before that, right, it was dial up modem. (laughs) You know, that that, that thing. Um, Anyway, so Reed Hastings um, very presciently said, the DVD business will go away. Uh, We're going to switch to all streaming. And he did it very early. And his solution uh, was to split the company. And the DVD part was going to be called Quickster. And the Netflix name would be born in part. And so he went to market with this thing that said, okay, customers, you know, you want to be a Quickster customer, you get to keep your DVD shipments. Uh, but if you want to be a Netflix customer, you're going to be your know, streaming. And he had two different prices. I think it was $7.99 for each service. So customers who've been getting both for some time thought this was a massive price increase. That was the first upsetting thing. Secondly, the queues were different. So if you wanted to get a, a hot movie, right, uh, you had to put it and you wanted it, you know, sort of get it to me whenever, I'll, I'll take the whatever comes first, right? You had to put it in both queues. So you had to have two queues. But worst of all, the streaming selection was much more limited than the DVD selection. 
So customers went into a fury. I mean, there was absolute outrage about this. And uh, Hastings <laughs> reportedly wrote back to his team. He said, well, I'm here at an investor conference. I think I'm going to need a food taster. <laughs> <laughs> and my argument in the book was that directionally, this was the right thing to do, but he didn't look at it through the customer's eyes. Um, and so they very famously walked back on that. And to me, like what he should have done was a much more, it was sort of what he should have done. To me, what he should have done was almost the reverse of when you enter a new market. You know, when you enter a new market, you you capture the early adopters first, and then you make your modifications, you get this next generation, what Jeff Moore is famously called crossing the chasm. Then you get your mainstream adopters and so forth. So what they could have done was eased customers out of their dependence on DVD. So the first tranche could have been, okay, you know, we'll, we'll charge you less if you agree to go streaming only. And that would have picked up a few of the early adopters. And then it could have been, hey, well, um, we'll give you, you know, more selection if you go streaming. You know, in other words, sort of ease customers out of the DVD business without shoving them out of it in any very rough way. Um, anyway, what happened was they, they basically had to walk that back. They said, sorry, sorry, never mind. <laughs> Our bad. Uh, but it still left them with this problem of what do I do with this your business? going into the And what they decided to do was they said, all right, we're going to run it as a mature business. So they picked a, a top-notch operations guy to run it. They moved the headquarters of that business about 40 miles away from Netflix's main headquarters. Um, and they gave him the instructions. They said, keep this thing going, but you know, run it for run it for efficiency, run it for cost. Because the great thing about a business in decline is you're not making investments to grow it, right? You're making investments basically to become more efficient. So you can be insanely profitable as a declining business, even as you're not growing. And that's in fact what's happened. So they've since rebranded it as DVD.com. So if you look up DVD.com, you'll see a DVD.com and Netflix company on their, on their website. Um, and that's what it's like, you know, it's, it's, uh, and so they've got about three or four million you know, die hard customers, which is nothing compared to Netflix's main customer base. But, you know, those people don't have great internet access, or they just prefer DVDs or whatever it is. They like their red envelopes and they're very happy <laughs> they're getting served that way. It's a great study. And, and it was, you know, you, you pegged it so early, which is great. I mean, it's so, so validating when they work out for you as well. But another one you mentioned, and, and this is kind of a, a different consideration is, so Reed Hastings was the major shareholder. So he made those decisions and sought the direction of the company. But then you look at big companies with multiple shareholders. One such company was Verizon and they made very brave decisions. Mm -hmm early on selling off assets that were still churning off very healthy profits, but they did it very, very cleverly. And this idea that you talk about healthy disengagement. Yeah. So what I think Ivan Seidenberg, who was the CEO at the time, a gentleman I greatly admire, what he was trying to do was really say, I, I'm going to run my portfolio. And this is something I think that even today, companies are not very good at. And then, by the way, one of the things Belize is really centered on, which is how do you look across your entire portfolio of investments and decide where you're placing your bets and where you should honestly be exiting? And very few organizations of any size have a clear eyed view across their whole portfolio of what they're actually doing. And what Seidenberg did was he said, look, I want to, I want to get decent prices for those assets, which I don't think are going to grow. And I want to get us into growth areas for the future. So among the many things he did, during his tenure was he sold off the phone book business, the physical phone book business, which at the time was basically printing money. You know, back to my comments about businesses in decline. Yeah, it's not a growth business, but it was very profitable. And he sold it off to a couple of hedge funds. Um, and people howled. They were like, how can you give up such steady guaranteed cash flow and invested in this weird stuff like BIOS? <laughs> how can you possibly do that? And his position was, look, I'm, I'm investing for the future. I'm investing for the future is anchored by these old products. These physical phone books are going to go away. It's pretty clear. Um, and you know, we are we we don't want to be in that business for the long term. We do want to be in business going direct to people's homes. And you know, at the time, um, phone companies were not in the, the direct home cable business. I mean, it was it was his venture into FiOS that changed that whole equation. So we mentioned Verizon, we mentioned Netflix and these kind of successful companies. And there's 10 exemplars, 10 
outliers you mentioned in the book, you, you highlight in the book, which are well worth reading for anybody. But let's share a failure story, Rita, because when we encounter innovators' dilemmas in real time, they all always make absolute sense in retrospect. But you shared one in some of your talks and in the book where you talk about Sony, for example, and you say, imagine, for example, we're making a fortune with this thing we created called the Walkman. And somebody from the R&D team walks in and gives a presentation. They're like, in the future, these connected devices won't be wired and you won't need to connect them to anything, et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, get out of my office. We're making a fortune. And that's the reality of what the future looks like. But you share how Sony played this out and how they became blind to what the future held for them. Yeah, there was a wonderful article that I believe was published I think as long ago as 1984, and it was talking about the civil war inside Sony. And what Sony leadership did not do was force the warring divisions to come together. And so if you think about it, Sony had the hardware people, so they made PCs, they made Walkman, they made all those things. Then they had the content people, so they owned movie studios um, and sound studios. Then they had the software people who did the, you know, the plumbing that went into all these things. So if you think about what it would take to create back in the day, it was an iPod. Um, you know, it was the integration of the hardware, the software, the, the the content to create this superior customer experience. And Sony just was never able to get the heads of its divisions to cooperate. And so it ended up being this internal civil war and they ended up losing the whole category. To me, a much sadder example is Nokia. And I worked with Nokia beginning in 1999 through 2006. So I had a really long opportunity to witness what was going on at the company. And, you know, they they fell into this sort of trap of just milking the existing business. Um, so they put in, they, and I remember getting, it would have been about 2004, a memo from a friend of mine. And I had written about Nokia's new venture organization and how forward thinking it was and how it was really an exemplar for how People needed to do these things, and it really worked well for quite a long time. And then basically, a guy came in whose mandate he thought was to generate as much free cash flow as possible, <laughs> and, and it insisted that the R&D department produce an ROI. I mean, you know how deadly that is. And what was interesting to me was you could see it years before it was published. So in 2007, uh, this CEO, Madame Ali Pekka Palas I was pictured on the front page of Forbes and the headline next to his name. So this is November of 2007. Uh, the headline next to his name was a billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? <laughs> and, and so you get press like that and you start drinking the Kool-Aid and you think you're smart when you were lucky. I make a case of Nokia in my own book and I know it's very old for you, but I found an article where one of the engineers in 2004 actually presented this idea of an app store and a touch screen, et cetera. Had you heard about that? I, I held it in my hands. I was, I was doing the project wow. at their R&D center. And in my hands, I held something that was about the size of an iPad. Um, it used a stylus, but it connected to the internet. It could bring up web pages. It did, yeah, all the stuff. I actually physically held it in my own hands. It really saddens me. And, and one of the reasons I do the show and I have great people on like you every week is Hopefully somebody somewhere is listening and it might change the fate of the organization because there's so many people reliant on organizations in the world. And that brings me to the next point and your concluding chapter of the book, which is what does this mean if we're in a transient advantage economy and more and more people are working as consultants, as temporary workers, as shift workers, etc. What does that mean for the individual? And I know this is the core concept in your work as well and something that you really want to communicate to everyone out there well i think the reality is that you can't you can't give responsibility for your life and career entirely to other entities you know at one point <laughs> you know the company designed your career path and hr told you what development experience you did and you moved up and you know that had that had advantages i'm not saying that was bad because you know, the theory of growth of the firm is basically that you have these people who are long-term committed to exploiting the idiosyncratic resources of the firm. But fewer and fewer places are like that these days. So among the implications are you really need to make sure your networks are up to date, your skills are up to date, that you're, you know, in contact with people, that you're not letting yourself get stale, that you're not letting yourself get sidelined. And 
you know, I think it's just very important to be prepared for that. I wrote an article last week and I said, don't be plankton. And plankton is a Greek word and it means to wander or float. And it's about the, those little organisms in the sea. And oftentimes we wander, we float throughout our careers, expecting somebody in sector 7G of the organization to be scripting, what does the future hold for Aidan McCullum? <laughs> and that's certainly shifted. This is something I think that it really, people really, really need to wake up to. This is going to be a reality in the future and that we're not going to work in one organization for the rest of our lives. What advice do you give for those type of people, those people who are coming into this new transient advantage economy? Well, I think, interestingly, a lot of them are already living in that world. So if you think about a typical 24-year-old, let's say, the people that that person is friends with and the network that they have is actually more representative of where they feel they belong than any particular organization that they see happen to be working for at any particular time. So I'll recall a story of a, a young uh, consultant who uh, got her MBA at Columbia and uh, went to work. And uh, she was given a project by her superiors at this consulting firm that they figured would take her you know, a couple of months. And she came back in two weeks with it done. And they were absolutely, you know, cops back. They were like, what? <laughs> How did you do that? She said, oh, well, you know, I have a friend who's a really great graphic designer and he helped me with the graphics. And I have another friend that was this. Now, what was fascinating to me was she had assembled this virtual team of about 10 people and they all worked for different companies, many of whom were competitors. <laughs> so their loyalty was to each other, not to, oh, I happen to be working for XYZ firm this week, but, you know, XYZ firm may be disloyal to me and let me go. But this network of friends I've got, they're going to be mine for life. And I think they look at the world very differently. The last person then that is so core and, you know, very much a listener to this show, the innovation worker or the change maker themselves in this economy. And we've mentioned about the threat of the current situation, the COVID situation and an impending recession or whatever we're going to go through. But what advice have you got for those people? Because I've been one of those people and you try and change business models and you can't do that. You, you need to attack it a different way. Well, it depends on where you are, right? Um, so if you're very junior, that's a different situation than if you're somewhat more senior. I think you really need to understand the motivations of the others in the organization. And you need to get back to what the incentives are, and then you need to try to tip them in your favor in some way. And that requires a very keen political sensibility. And so I think, you know, coming in and saying the right will rule and I have the right answer is not going to be very helpful for you. I think what you really need to do is say, you know, my CEO cares an awful lot about free cash flow, so I'm going to float an idea that will help him with free cash flow <laughs> and, you know, build up credibility with those kinds of projects first. And then maybe you get the green light to do something more ambitious. Rita, for people who want to find out more about your work, you've so much out there. I'll link to the books, et cetera. But for people who want to find out more about Valise, about your consulting work, where can they find you? Well, I have a website, very imaginatively called readamagraph.com. And that's <laughs> all kinds of stuff on it. It's got my newsletters. I publish a monthly newsletter, um, which you can subscribe to. It's for free. And then Valise is just B-A-L-I-C-E.com. And we're just getting going. So it's, it's early stages yet. But you're certainly welcome to visit there. And uh, that, that's a great place. I'm also on all the social media channels. So I have a YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to. I have. I've got two wonderful summer interns helping me with my Instagram. So I'm now on Instagram. <laughs> and of course, LinkedIn and Twitter and all this. So uh, yeah, I'm on all. I'm pretty easy to find. Good news for our audience. If you sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter, I have a fantastic copy of End of Competitive Advantage, How to Keep Your Strategy Moving as Fast as Your Business. And I want to thank sincerely author of that book, which is just a fantastic read. One of my favorite reads in innovation, Rita McGrath. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure.